campus of North Idaho College and today's broadcast of the North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of North Idaho College television students. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. Today our subject is wildlife photography. In fact, we have with us Bill McRae, who is one of the most published wildlife photographers and outdoor writers in the United States. His photographs are published in such prestigious magazines as National Wildlife, Outdoor Life, Field and Stream, and Sports Field. He is a four-time winner of photography competition at the Outdoor Writers Association of American Convention. In fact, twice his works have been named as the best at that show. Examples of his work uh, may be found on the covers of the 1980 uh, February issue of Field and Stream and the March issue of Sports Field and Peterson's Hunting Magazine. Uh, Bill, welcome to our program. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Joining with me in questioning our guests about uh, wildlife photography and writing are three members of the panel. First of all, regular panelists, uh, Mary Lou Reed, visiting panel member uh, Tim Christie, and John House. Welcome, panel. Thank we'll you. start the questioning with Mary Lou Reed. Well, Bill, when did you first start taking pictures of wild animals? I bought my first camera in 1962, and I sold my first pictures in 63. I wrote my first article in uh, early 1964 and sold it uh, to Outdoor Life magazine. So you started taking pictures and became professional just about uh, boom, boom, boom. How, how, was, how did that happen? Well, I, I thought it was easy at the time, but I, I found out since that it isn't easy. I just had some, uh, some good fortune to start with and uh, apparently got some good pictures to begin with. Is the field crowded? Are there a lot of you taking pictures uh, of animals? Yes, the field is very crowded. When, when, I, when I first started back in the early 60s, there were, there were very few uh, professional wildlife photographers. And today in the more popular places such as Yellowstone Park or McKinley Park in Alaska, it seems that there's a wildlife ph photographer behind every tree. <laughs> and, and most of you are freelance, uh, sending your pictures into various publications on your own. You're not commissioned. This, this is true. Most of the uh, uh, wildlife photographers in the United States are freelance and operate on a freelance basis. And they aren't endangered at all. No, there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of wildlife photographers, a lot of competition. Tim Christie. Okay, Bill, probably one of the things that I'm sure a lot of our viewers would like to know is that you have succeeded where others have failed in terms of selling photographs as art to magazines. What, in your opinion, makes art in terms of wildlife photography? The, uh, well, that's a, that's a big question. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, for something to be art, it has to be, uh, create an emotional experience for the person that, that views it. And uh, I, I think perhaps one of the reasons I'm successful is that I'm, I'm personally uh, you might say, turned on by uh, wild animals, especially the large mammals. They interest me. They fascinate me. I love them. I love to be with them. And uh, perhaps I capture some of this in my photography. And uh, in, in other words, the emotional experience that I feel, I'm able to convey to those who uh, view my work. Okay. One of the things that I know you wrote in an article, and I think it was in Sports of Field Magazine or Field and Stream a couple years ago, with respect to the grizzly bears is that it's very difficult to capture the fluid motion of an animal and things like that. Um, do you find that uniquely difficult in terms of grizzly bears or do you find that unique in terms of all animals, wildlife? It is uh, uh, uniquely difficult in terms of grizzly bears and there, there are a couple reasons for this. Uh, one thing, the, the grizzly, grizzly bear is a uh, very dangerous animal and there's a uh, he has a sense of charisma. In other words, you're, you're thrilled just being near one. And uh, maybe you're excited about the situation, but uh, there really isn't that much there in terms of uh, photographs. And another thing is that the, the beauty of the grizzly bear is found in his fluid motions. Uh, one, of the, one of the prettiest things in the, in the world of nature is a running grizzly bear. He moves with a, a beauty that's uh, just uh, undescribable. His, his motions are fluid, his, his hair flows, and it's just like wheat blowing in the wind. 
And when you take a still picture and, and stop that motion, you, you, you lose much of what the grizzly bear is. Where other animals, for, inst for instance, a bighorn sheep, he's a majestic animal. He has beautiful uh, horns uh, that uh, uh, curl, and he, he poses a lot. He'll stand there and, and display those horns very uh, majestically. So you can take a still picture of a sheep or an elk or a deer and get an outstanding photo. And it's, it's tough with grizzlies. There's very few places where you can stop a grizzly's motion and have him look good. John Howe. Bill, nearly everybody that has a, an active subscription to one of the big three sports magazines uh, <coughs> and is currently shackled to a desk dreams about the day that they can throw off all those bonds and they're going to become a freelance outdoor writer or outdoor photographer. Uh, how true is, is that kind of an image that all of us probably harbor? How, how much time do you get to spend in the out of doors and what kinds of concessions do you have to make to be able to do that? Uh, it's not what a lot of people think it is. You have, <laughs> to, sp you have to spend a lot of time behind a desk. I, I do it because I love it and it does enable me to, to do what I enjoy most, uh, at least a part of the year. But actually, uh, I spend about 30 days a year actually in the field taking pictures of wildlife. And the rest of the time I'm writing articles, uh, uh, once in a while I get inspired about an article and enjoy writing it, but writing is hard work. And uh, for a person that likes being active out of doors, sitting and writing is, is, is boring. So uh, you spend a lot of time uh, in correspondence, sending pictures to different markets around the country. So uh, it's, uh, it's not a way to uh, escape working for a living. How often, uh, what's the, the ordinary time lapse between the time you might submit an article or, or a photograph and the time you might hear whether or not they like what Bill McCray did? Well, uh, I, th I think probably the, I perhaps have the world's record on an article. I've had articles out as long as seven years, uh, bought, <laughs> paid for, and, and sat in an editor's uh, file for seven years before they were published. Uh, generally, uh, the things that I shoot uh, and wildlife photography is seasonal, you do it in the fall. Uh, but the things that I shoot in the fall, I maybe uh, get to editors around the first of the year. And uh, uh, if they buy the pictures, a uh, good chance they'll be published in the fall issues. Uh, I specialize in, in big game animals, and uh, the magazines publish big game articles in the fall. Uh, for instance, in the spring, they publish fishing articles. So uh, mostly, it's, it's usually about uh, nine months. Lou Reed. Well, during those 30 days that you are taking pictures, what are some of the qualities that make for a good wildlife photographer? The first question that comes to mind is patience. Does it really, do you do a lot of waiting and sitting? Uh, no, I don't. I, I, think, I think some photographers do. At least this is an image that people have of photographers, is that they sit in blinds for hours and spend a lot of uh, time just sitting and waiting. And I, I'm not built that way. Well, then how do you find the animals? I, charge up to I, I get out and I hike. I, I spend a lot of time with binoculars, glassing. This is very important. Uh, I work a lot in national parks, but even there, they're, they're big places. And to find a, a bighorn sheep that is, is really uh, majestic and has uh, large antlers, uh, an animal that perhaps is in the Boone and Crockett record class, you have to spend a lot of time looking. You have to spend a lot of time sitting down with binoculars and just uh, uh, taking the country apart until you find them. Well, how about uh, camouflage and and, uh, and walking and approaching them? Do you, I'm sure you have some methods of uh, walking on moccasins. I uh, well, I have used uh, camouflage, but uh, as a matter of uh, policy, I let the animals see me, and then let it get used to my presence, and then try and move in as uh, as fast as I can or as slow as I have to. I, I've spent enough time with animals that I can I can almost read their minds. I can, I can tell you when an animal's about to flee and when it's uh, relaxed, and uh, and I never I never move directly toward an animal. I perhaps will will zigzag toward it, you know, walk over here and look around, and then move over here. And if you walk straight toward an animal, you're 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 threatening, and uh, the animal will very often spook and run. Do you have to be willing to take risks? Is this kind of a dangerous business? Uh, really not. I. Uh, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to disillusion anyone. But uh, I, I've always said that I, the most dangerous thing I do is getting in my automobile and driving to the places where I take pictures. And next to that, the, the greatest danger is fall. I spend a lot of time in the mountains. I photograph bighorn sheep and Rocky Mountain goats. And you sometimes have to get out on cliffs and ledges and so on. And there is a good chance of, uh, of falling. Uh, the law of gravity is immutable. 
It's unforgiving, so if you uh, lose your footing, why you're, you might go all the way to the bottom of the mountain. Where a grizzly bear, if a grizzly charges, if you stand your ground, why usually you can bluff him down. Well, this affinity for the animals, then, is, is what you consider to be the most important element of temperament, then, in, in your own history. I think so. I, uh, some uh, naturalists seem to feel that animals have a, a sixth sense. In other words, they know whether you mean them ill or not. And uh, this may be true. I don't know. It's, uh, it's greatly different if you're, if you're out there with a gun looking for a deer. The deer seems to know that you're uh, trying to kill him. Well, if you're out there to take his, his picture, why, he seems to sense that you don't uh, uh, mean to harm him. Now, perhaps he's just reading your body language. I don't know. Or my body language, see. The deer looks at me and sees the way I act and my attitude and, and senses something there. Perhaps animals are better at nonverbal communications than we are. Tim Christie. Bill, um, probably the, the thing that most people outside of wildlife photographers or photographers themselves think of is that you, you know, the equipment that you use is probably the reason that you're such a good photographer. The person who buys all of the very, very expensive equipment or the idea that if you buy a 400 millimeter telephoto lens that you can go out and you can take a picture of a deer a mile away or something like that. Could you kind of elaborate on some of the things as far as equipment and maybe show us a little bit about yours? Okay. I brought uh, one of my uh, camera outfits along. <coughs> this is a Nikon uh, FM camera with a uh, motor drive that shoots uh, it shoots three and a half frames a second. You can go through a roll of film in a hurry. That uh, clicks off a lot of pictures and a lot of money fast. <laughs> and this is a 400 millimeter lens, and that uh, is, uh, has eight power magnification. It's as, as if you were looking through an eight power pair of binoculars. But one thing I do want to uh, emphasize, though I, I use the best equipment and uh, the best that money will buy, uh, good photography is, is not really so much a matter of having some uh, magic camera or some special camera. Good photography is, is mo more than anything else in the eye of the photographer. The ability to uh, uh, know art when you see it through the viewfinder. And uh, I feel that's, that's very important. And to sell wildlife photos today, you have to produce art, really. It's, it's not just enough to go out and, and take pictures of animals, but you, you have to have something that uh, uh, as I said before, is an emotional experience for the viewer, and it has to be uh, good as far as composition is concerned. It helps if you can get a catch light in the animal's eye. It always makes the animal look alive and seem alert. But uh, so on equipment, I I, uh, I use the best I can. But uh, you can put too much emphasis on equipment. Uh, I, I'm sure that I would do just about as well as I I do if I had uh, lesser cameras. Okay. In, in terms of, for example, the idea of the, the taking the photograph you know, two or three hundred yards away of a bull elk or something like that, what's the average range that you work with when you're taking, the, taking pictures of most okay. animals? Now, this is the, uh, the longest lens I use. This has the most magnification. It's eight power. And even with this lens, to get a good wildlife photo, and this, that isn't a close-up, but just a good uh, the animal large enough in the picture so it really means something, you have to be within 50 yards. So the idea that you can get a telephoto lens that will reach out a quarter of a mile, it, uh, it, it, it isn't so. It just doesn't work that way. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've joined our program in progress, our guest today is Bill McRae, who is one of the best published wildlife photographers and outdoor writers in the United States today. We shall continue the questioning with John House. Bill, a pretty common statement that you hear from people who enjoy to hike or, or hunting and fishing, whatever it might be is that I've just got to learn to take my camera along because I see during the course of a day a hundred things that would make excellent covers for one of those big three. Do you really agree with that or do you think that you have to go into the woods or should go into the woods with the idea that, that I'm not hunting today, today I'm taking the photographs or I'm not fishing today, today I'm photographing? Okay, uh, let me say that I have never taken a wildlife picture on a hunting trip and I, I hunt a great deal. I write hunting articles for the magazines. But I've never taken a picture on a, a wildlife shot on a hunting trip that has ever been published. I go out specifically to take pictures of animals. And uh, though I do uh, sometimes take pictures of the hunt, for instance, the hunting camp or uh, a hunter standing on a hill, that sort of thing, uh, glassing, I, I take that type of picture on hunts. But I also go out specifically to shoot that type of picture. 
uh, a good time to do that is this time of year. You can take a friend and uh, have him put his uh, hunting uh, clothes on and take his gun and his knife and some of the appurtenance that he uses hunting and you can go out and climb a mountain and take some hunting pictures. And, and very often, at least in my articles, the, uh, the hunting pictures that are with the articles are often taken that way. Uh, Bill, you do uh, so much work in this field and uh, certainly have been so successful. Uh, for the pictures or photographs that you get, I should say, that are what you believe are your best and, and are bought by the different magazines or by individuals, uh, how many pictures do you take to get the, uh, your quality ones, for example? Do you take uh, out of every 100, you get 10 or 20 or what? Or what kind of ratio? I would, uh, this is just an off the top of my head uh, guess, but I would say that probably 75% of the pictures that I take are publishable. Uh, probably uh, uh, 5% uh, are, are very good and uh, maybe 1% is great or super, whatever. What are some of the, the, the type of animals or, or the scenes in which you take them uh, that are most popular as far as uh, the general population is concerned that they would buy? Is it a particular kind of animal and uh, in a particular setting? Uh, some animals are, are much more popular than others. Uh, a very popular animal, at least in the markets I sell to, is the white-tailed deer. Uh, of course, I, I sell a lot of my work to hunting magazines and books about hunting. And I also sell uh, pictures to, uh, to hunters as art. And everybody that uh, hunts big game hunts white-tailed deer. So there's a lot more uh, pictures of white-tailed deer published. Some animals uh, seem to have a bit of charisma. The, uh, the bighorn sheep is a very popular animal, and, and few people get to hunt them. But I think uh, practically everyone that uh, does hunt wishes he could hunt bighorn sheep. Something else that you told the students at the forum that I was impressed with is that you have really three types of photographs, one being the portrait and so forth, which you explain to those people who are uh, camera bugs and are interested in this, the, the three major types, and uh, which one uh, I would like to ask also is your favorite? Well, the, the three basic types are, are uh, you can divide them into the ranges at which they're taken. There is the close-up, which is usually a, a head and shoulder shot. It's uh, comparable to the, the portrait in, people, mm -hmm. in pictures of people. Mm -hmm. And then there are shots taken at a, a medium range where the, the animal, you have the entire animal in the picture, but it pretty well uh, fills the the frame. And then there's the, uh, there are the distant shots are pictures of uh, animals in a scene. Now the animal doesn't have to be very large in this type of picture if you have a beautiful background and a beautiful scene. And I believe uh, my, my favorite is the, the scene with the animal in it. Louis. Bill, how do you explain the current appeal of wildlife photography? Do you think uh, Disney has had a great deal to do with this? Uh, no doubt. Uh, in, in recent years, and uh, perhaps starting in the 60s, there, people began to have a lot of interest in the environment. And perhaps the, the fact that people today are, uh, are somewhat cooped up in large cities, the majority of our population is no longer uh, rural, and, and people don't get to see animals very often. Consequently, uh, animals are unique to them, and especially wild animals, especially game animals. And uh, this perhaps accounts for some of the interest. Do you think a white-tailed deer symbolizes anything other than maybe the, uh, the object of, of the hunter? Do you think something like the deer, uh, symbolizing nature, surely, but also freedom? Uh, sort of, uh, you know, anti-civilization uh, uh, nostalgia? <laughs> I, I think this is true, and it's especially true of the person that's uh, tied to a 40-hour uh, uh, job in some large city. He seldom gets out to breathe fresh air, and he uh, seldom sees animals, and, and perhaps the animals do speak of a freedom that he wishes he had. You don't shoot whales, but I'm really intrigued <laughs> by the incredible response that we seem to have, sort of, as, as a, he, all of humanity, towards the whale and towards sea animals, mm -hmm. and certainly the, the problems that we see in their in endangered status. There, there seems mm -hmm. to be a, a special kind of a appeal that must have to do with their motion and, and some other things they represent. Uh, well, here, as, as you mentioned, I don't shoot pictures of whales. Uh, takes other kinds of equipment. It takes other <laughs> kinds of equipment. You have to have underwater cameras. <laughs> and uh, uh, of course, the whale is endangered. And uh, whales are highly intelligent. Most of the animals I f uh, photograph are highly intelligent. They're more intelligent than we give them credit for being. And uh, uh, perhaps it's just respecting the, their intelligence and, uh, in a sense, uh, being able to communicate with them to some degree that makes me successful as a wildlife photographer. I don't know.
Tim Christie. Um, kind of going back to an issue that John raised earlier in the program about the idea that of, of making a living as far as a wildlife photographer is concerned. Recently, Leonard LaRue, who is probably one of the more published photographers in this area, said more or less flatly that you can't make a living as a wildlife photographer. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that position? Um, you seem to be one of the very few who has been able to, to break out of that mold or that thought that LaRue forwarded. Uh, it's very hard to make a living as a, I believe what he said was as a still wildlife mm -hmm. photographer, which would be excluding the, uh, the motion picture industry. And incidentally, it's getting harder and harder for uh, people to make a living taking pictures of wildlife because uh, the wildlife films have to compete with prime time programs. But uh, uh, I can make a living taking pictures of wildlife in conjunction with my writing. Uh, this, this is important. I think uh, I'm perhaps what you would call an outdoor photo journalist. And, uh, and Leonard Lee Rue, the man that you mentioned, who's one of America's finest wildlife photographers, he writes books, he writes magazine articles, he lectures, and I'm sure that he makes a very good living. Okay. The, o the other thing that probably people want to know um, in conjunction with this is, is you've said you've taken a, take a lot of your pictures in national parks. Probably another misnomer that a lot of people have is the idea that you go out in the national forest and shoot your pictures of your elk and things like that. Um, do you find the national parks to be the best place to take pictures, and where do you take most of your pictures? Not specific locations, but okay. I take uh, I take a, most of my pictures in national parks, some on game refuges, but the national parks are the best places to uh, to work with wildlife. And there are several reasons for that. There are a lot of animals there. They're not her well, they are harassed sometimes, but they're not hunted, and uh, so there are more animals there. They're a little easier to work with. And also, the, I can find uh, large trophy animals. Hmm. The type I, I specialize in taking pictures of large males, uh, the, the, the elk with the large antlers, something that turns the hunter on. And they're easier to find in national parks. Uh, but uh, very few people uh, take a, I don't know anyone who uh, does very well just going out in the woods and taking wildlife pictures. John Howe. What comes first, Bill, the pictures or the story? Uh, I believe it works both ways. I sometimes uh, have a story idea and I'll shoot pictures strictly for the story. Other times uh, the uh, pictures will trigger a story idea. I, perhaps I, I go out and I get some good pictures of a couple bighorn sheep fighting. They, they're up on a cliff batting heads. Well, you've got an ideal picture story there. And uh, so you maybe write uh, 500 words to just explain what's going on and you have something that will sell. I think, go ahead, what kind of a market is there in, uh, of course we all talk about Everybody dreams that they're going to run out with their Instamatic and shoot something that's going to end up in one of the big three. But what kind of a market is there aside from the big three, and does it include any advertising market? There's, a, there's actually a very large market apart from the big three. Uh, one, one, th one mistake I think a lot of writers make is, is trying to sell to the big three and uh, uh, ignoring the other markets. And the big three, which is outdoor life, field and stream, and sports of field, these are the toughest markets to sell for, sell to because everybody sends their work to them. Well, there are a lot of uh, smaller markets that don't uh, pay as much, but uh, as a group, they use a lot more photos. So actually, uh, even whether writing or selling pictures, some people mm -hmm. make way more money writing for the smaller markets. I think this is a good time, Bill, to show some of your work uh, that you have brought with you. And because this is a limited uh, time period on the show, we'll only show three of your uh, <coughs> works. And uh, if the viewers would like to get a pen or pencil, I'm going to give your address at the end in case they would like to write to you or to call you about your works. And I think this time what we're going to do is to mm -hmm. uh, get up and show some of your works and uh, let you describe uh, uh, the characteristics of these and, um, and why they are popular. This will be the first one right here that we'll show. Okay, this is a... Uh, a very, a very, very large mule deer buck. Uh, this is a popular picture. I have it in limited edition, and uh, I think one of the reasons that uh, people like it is, uh, is, is the type of shot where you have an animal in a scene, and uh, there's a storm in the background there uh, behind the deer on the mountains on the uh, far side of the valley, and it, I think people feel something. They have an emotional experience when they look at it. And uh, it's a popular picture for that reason, I believe. Mm -hmm. Bill, maybe this is a good time to ask uh, while these pictures are being shown uh, so that uh, we can set the stage. I am asking you a leading question because we've already had a chance to talk, all, all the entire group. 
But you mentioned earlier in a, another uh, speech that one of the questions that you get asked all the time is, where are these pictures taken? Okay. <laughs> in answer to that question, and to keep from having to uh, answer it over and over again, I tell people that I, I have a deal with the animals. They let me take their pictures, and in turn, I don't tell anyone where they live. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it tends to cut off the questions. This is a, uh, a portrait of a bighorn sheep. And this is the, the close-up type of picture. And uh, uh, I like portraits. They're, they're simple. And, and good art is always simple. That's one of the characteristics of good art, is simplicity. And you'll notice the catch light in the eye, the reflection in the eye. That's very important. It's, uh, when I take pictures of wildlife, I always focus on the eye. I emphasize the eye. I try to get the eye in the picture. And I also point out to the viewers that uh, these works are for sale and that you have them, I believe, two ways, either framed as these are that we're showing or they can have them that aren't framed, which are right. a little bit cheaper uh, that way. If I can get this one down here, we'll show one more to the viewers. And I would like to indicate, too, that uh, certainly we're only showing just three examples. He has many, many more uh, that are available. Okay, this is a, a cougar. It's another uh, example of a portrait. Uh, this is one of my favorite shots, I, uh, perhaps because I like cats. I like uh, all sorts of cats. The, I like house cats, and I like uh, the big cats. The interesting thing is all cats are very, uh, all cats are cats. I don't care if it's a mountain lion or an African lion. He, he thinks like a cat. He acts like a cat. He purrs, and uh, if you love cats, you love them all. This is a really, really attractive one. Uh, Louis, we have time for one more question. Well, why is Novin Magazine in the top three? Pardon? Why isn't Audubon Magazine in the top three? Uh, I say this is with okay. close ties to Audubon. Audubon Magazine uh, is a natural history magazine. And uh, natural history magazines simply do not do as well. Perhaps it's sad that they don't, but they don't do as well as the hunting magazines. And birds are not as popular as big animals? Uh, people, uh, well, the birds that are hunted are popular. The ducks, the geese, uh, the uh, upland game birds, pheasants, uh, grouse, and so on are popular. The birds that, uh, songbirds, do not tend to be as popular. I have to interrupt. Uh, the clock is called up, and I do want to let our viewers have this address. If you would like to write to our guest about his work, uh, you write Bill McRae, that's capital M-C, capital R-A-E, Post Office Box 415, Fairfield, Montana. That is Post Office Box 415, Fairfield, Montana, 59436. Thank you, Bill, for being with us. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll be with us again next week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at this same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by a North Idaho College student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time. <laughs>